What's up, everybody? Is nobody else awake? Am I the only one? Uh, I woke up at 4 o'clock this morning. I don't know why, but I did. And I couldn't go back to sleep. So about noon today, I'll be dead asleep in my office. But I got a lot of energy right now. Uh, I did something this morning that I think I've never done in my 48 years of living in Southern California. I got in my car, and I couldn't see out the window because there was, I don't know, frost, ice, something weird like that, because I left the house at like 6 in the morning. So as a typical Southern California, I had no clue what to do, so I pulled out my APU ID card, and I scraped my windows. So <laughs> it was a great day. Hey, this morning, uh, I am excited to talk with you about Jesus. I'm really excited to talk to you about how Jesus has radically changed my life and millions and millions of people's lives over the centuries. I'm excited today because students are going to come tell you what Jesus has done in their lives. Uh, what we're doing is we're in Philippians chapter 2, and uh, it's a university passage we're focused on in spring, and uh, I'm just going to give you the answer right away. Uh, to the question. Um, the question is, does anybody know what cornerstone we're focusing on? Christ, right? Who is the what? The chief cornerstone. That without Christ, scholarship, community, service doesn't make any sense. That what we're talking about in Philippians today and what we talked about in uh, Micah 6, 8 a while back is that uh, basically without Christ, nothing makes sense. And so the chief cornerstone of how we live our lives is really focused on that. And I don't know if you remember, but what we did uh, back, uh, I think it was three weeks ago when I preached the first time on Philippians, we didn't even jump into Philippians 2, 1 to 11. Um, what we did is we actually focused in on uh, chapter 1. And so, you know, Philippians 2 talks about Christ's characteristics, obedience, and all the importance of in there. But I jumped straight to chapter 1, and I asked you some questions. I asked you this. I just want you to remember that chapel. How do we acknowledge each other was one question I asked. I asked, how do we greet each other? I said, how do we interact and I showed you a bunch of memes of how people like greet each other and do head nods and all that whatnots. And if you remember, I looked at chapter one and showed you how the Apostle Paul greeted grace and peace. If, if you weren't here, all you'd have to do is look at that chapter one. I'm not going to read it, but there's these really bold yellow highlighted words. The Apostle Paul in every interaction and in every letter would begin with a God's grace and peace to you. Uh, I don't know if any of you have been practicing that. I found one person practice it with me, but I'm also really trying to practice grace and peace. In fact, yesterday, I promise I wasn't trying to set this up for a sermon. It was just reality. I was sitting in a meeting, and we were talking about some really, really difficult, heavy things, and it just felt overwhelming. Uh, does anybody know what it's like when you feel punched in the stomach and you just don't know what to do? And all of a sudden, we're all just kind of sitting there, and all of a sudden, I just started going, oh, God's grace and peace over all of this. God's grace and peace, even though we don't know what to do. God's grace and peace as we figure out how to move forward. And I had another encounter yesterday that was a difficult conversation with someone, and I, I think I responded wrongly. I think I set a certain tone to the conversation. I went back and met with that person, talked to that person, and I felt like what I was given from that person was God's grace and peace. If you, the reason I'm going back to chapter one is we're not done living that out because I think that's a lifestyle. It's everything that in Jesus Christ, would you call out God's grace and peace in every situation and every opportunity you have? But today, here's what we're going to do. We're going to jump into actually chapter two, verse one, verse two, only one little word, A. Let me read it to you. It goes like this. If you have any encouragement from Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then. I didn't put anything else in chapter 2 in there. I just put then. Let me do some yellow highlighting again. Look at these if words. If you have any encouragement, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then. I want to focus on that word if for a second, because uh, if you don't remember anything else from Philippians 2 during this whole series, this is the one thing I really want you to remember. 
you got to think about this first word at every one of the beginning of those little phrases. Uh, it seems like it's a conditional clause. Uh, it seems like uh, if you've done these things, then maybe I'll do that with you. Uh, some of you are looking for new roommates right now and trying to figure out next year, and you're like, if you have a big screen TV and you don't talk a lot and you go to bed at 10 o'clock, then I'll be your roommate. Or, you know, uh, <laughs> it, it's really hard to kind of like capture what's happening here in chapter two because the temptation is to approach chapter two with a consumer mentality. Uh, like, when I watch cell phone commercials, all the different ones like Verizon, AT&T, T-Mobile, all of them, they're all trying to get my attention about how much they will give me, and all of a sudden now I'm starting to roam around going, well, how much uh, data? How cheap will it be? Uh, do I get a new phone? Do I get the iPhone 274 or uh, the iPhone 6, right? Like, like, we are used to bartering. We're used to being consumers. And my biggest fear and one of the biggest things I wanted to point out in this first part of chapter two is if is not the right English word unless we understand how if is being used. I'm a little nervous that if we approach this with a what have you done for me lately attitude, we're not going to get it. If we approach this with a what has God done for me lately, we're not going to get this right because we start from the very beginning as if the center of the universe and what God should do is be focusing on me rather than me focusing on God. Let me help it make a little bit more sense. Translators will say that the word since is a better translation. Listen to it highlighted in the yellow. Since there is encouragement and uh, relationship with Christ. Since there is comfort from his love. Since you have shared in the spirit. Since you have received tenderness and compassion. Then. Think about the word since for a little bit. It changes everything. Since your mom was the only person bringing income into your home, she worked the night shift and never slept during the day, and it was easy to love and appreciate her. Since a grandparent saved up forever, this is a true story about my mom's grandparent, saved up forever so that she could have money to go to college and he would wear shirts that were missing buttons. Since her grandfather sacrificed everything, there was a deep appreciation and love. The best way to translate this is since, not if. There's a, a, a really smart theologian, commentator, writer uh, that says that if you think about it this way, maybe the if will make more sense. It's an ironic understatement rather than a conditional clause. If you guys are going to capture Philippians 2, if I'm going to capture Philippians 2 so it has an impact on our lives, we need to read it as a sense. Since God has done so much, I cannot help but live radically different. Since I remember everything Christ has done for me, I now live completely different than I would in my own power and strength. The word is if, and it's an ironic understatement. The best way I thought I could illustrate that uh, today was to actually give you some real life illustrations. So I want you to hear three student stories slash testimonies. And so uh, Marcel, get up here, you're my first one, hurry up. <laughs> Man, you look like a hundred times nicer than I do. I look like a sloppy guy that woke up with a sweatshirt this morning. You look sharp today, Marcel. Thank you. I, we are not going to do justice to uh, the conversation that we had in my office. Uh, but you came into my office and we were talking about who Christ is to you and how much of an impact Christ has had. Uh, you mind just sharing with everybody in kind of a broad, general way who Jesus is to you? What's yes, your relationship of course. With oh, like? man, it's crazy. So... Um, I would say strength. I've had a long journey that uh, many times it felt like it was very much on, on my own. But uh, Jesus was very present. He encouraged me. And also his love, his mercy, and comfort, especially in the times that I felt like I had nothing left. Those tests of my faith, and that's when, you know, I realized who is Jesus is yeah. for me. Yeah. Uh, are you okay if I tell everybody that we cried together? Is that all right? Oh, yeah, of okay. course, of course. We <laughs> Tears of joy. He cried more. <laughs> uh, we, we, 
When Marcel came into my office, he started the conversation in tears talking about who Christ was to him. And it deeply moved me, and I wanted you to hear some bits and pieces of it. You just talked about what Christ is to you, but there's a story that probably 90% of this community has no idea about. Why does Christ mean so much to you? What's happened in the last six years that they need to know about? Yes, uh, so my story is an adventure. I'm from the Democratic Republic of the Congo from Central Africa. So I grew up in the Congo, and I had to flee to Uganda when I was young. Spent two years in Uganda without my family. Then when finally my family showed up, God opened doors for me to move to the United States. So I moved to Kansas, then later on moved to LA. So I spent the last four years without my family. But last year in October, I just, I was missing them very much, like missing them so much that I had to write on a card, God, I need you to give my family a visa mm -hmm. now. I placed the card in the box, my prayer box that I put next to my bed. And so in the morning when my alarm went off, I pulled up my phone and I saw a message from my sister that on, not only they got visas, but they're moving to the United States. <laughs> it's getting better, it's getting better. It's, it's getting, getting better. better. <laughs> it's getting better. So they moved to the US, they moved to the US in October. I had to spend Thanksgiving with them, and it was the first time in four years. Yeah, it was crazy. crazy. I went to Denver Airport. They were crying at the airport. And so the most important thing, I think, oh, yes, the picture's right there. <laughs> two of my cousins and two of my sisters. Other four people are not there. But the most important thing to me was the fact that not only God graced me to see my family, but he was with me even when my family was not there. Right. And so when I had to see my family, I saw them in a different way. I was grateful to see them. I remember touching my mom, and she wanted to go to sleep, and I was telling her, no, don't sleep. I haven't seen you for four years. <laughs> and, so, yeah. and so I was, you know, I let her sleep, and I was coming in the middle of the night, opening the door, and looking at her, hey, are you still there? I'm trying to pinch myself. Yeah. Is this for real, you know? And so I was kissing all the time. But it's amazing how faithful our God is, you know. Amen. Philippians yeah. 1 6 says that he who has started good work in you will bring its completion yeah. until the day of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Yeah. So uh, we, we, we talked about how faithful God was for almost an hour and a half. Uh, your story is not going to be done justice today, but God is the hero of your story. Uh, there was that word then. How do you live differently now, Marcel? Man, I'm so. I would use the word crazy, but in a good way. I'm crazy about him, you know, because my life depends completely on him. So he transformed me, and I cannot look back to my story without praising him. When they play songs like You Made a Way, for me, I'm not just saying You Made a Way. I'm yeah. seeing the way. I'm seeing the Congo. I'm seeing when I was a kid, the wars and everything he has done. Yeah. I can't help but be crazy. For yeah. some people, it's weird, but for me, it's being grateful to the God that calls me, but also for, little, for things that you might think that they are small, things like electricity. For me, I wake up, I see electricity, I say, thank you, God, because yeah. I did not have it every day. Yeah. I see, you know, I wake up, I'm in the warm shower, I thank God for it. But most importantly, being here has helped me understand that my story was very important so that I may share to other people about Jesus Amen. Christ. Amen. It's more important than being comfort here and having all these good things, but most importantly, looking forward for the glory that is in heaven. Amen. So if you do not know him, you should. He's an awesome guy. Exactly. Yeah. Thanks, Father. Thank so, uh, you, you're starting to see a hint of why I felt like students needed to share today. Since Marcel has experienced the love, the encouragement, the presence of Christ, and by the way, I want to put in parentheses, not because life was easy, but life was chaotic, crazy. Since Christ has been there, he cannot help but be different. I, I want you to think about it this way. What Philippians 2 does is it asks us to remember. It asks us to remember what God has done. It asks us to remember the magnitude and the cost of what Jesus Christ did to give us hope and strength in the middle of the difficult, the painful, the overwhelming. Here's what I would tell you so important to remember about uh, Philippi, the letter to the Philippians, that city 
Remember, there was persecution there. Paul isn't writing, since you have been treated generously, since Jesus has been present, since the Holy Spirit has worked amongst you and life was easy. He really was saying, since you find yourself beaten, cheated, marginalized, ignored, be faithful for what God does in the midst of difficulty. I want you to think about it this way. This is not a passage or a book that says Christ is the chief cornerstone. If you follow Jesus, it's easy. I think what Philippians says is there is one thing every human being has in common. Because of sin, this planet is difficult. Don't do it alone. You don't have the strength. You don't have the ability. Christ can make all things different, even in the midst of the pain and the brokenness and the unknowns. Uh, I think we need some more testimony. Wisdom, get up here. Oh, yeah, I should have given you the microphone. My bad. Uh, wisdom, I want to start the same place I did with Marcel. Who's Jesus to you? All right, Jesus to me. Um, I have found, especially in the last, I think, year, that um, God has proven to me that he's literally everything he describes himself in the mm. word to be. To, uh, yeah, to me, provider, uh, ever present, living hope, um, my father. So, yeah. yeah. I, I didn't go looking for difficult, broken, um, uh, really discouraging stories, but it's interesting in the testimonies that came up for this day. Uh, different than Marcel, but it's been a tough season for you too. You mind sharing an example of one of the ways that Christ has just been absolutely present for you in the last year? Yeah. So, um, this past summer, I had the great opportunity to go with APU to Europe through our comm department. Uh, yeah, comm. And uh, we were traveling to different countries, and I remember being in the Amsterdam airport. We were about to board our flight to Germany, and my little brother, J-Love, he calls me um, crying, and he proceeds to tell me that our mom has had a brain aneurysm and that she's not going to make it. <laughs> and so... Um, that shattered me. Uh, a little context about my mom. She is the main breadwinner of our family. She is the, also the main caretaker for my dad, who's also physically incapable. So um, when I came home, um, I had to live in UV to keep my job because now I'm the only one working in my family. And my 17-year-old brother was managing everything going on at the hospital back home. And uh, <laughs> essentially, I had no mom, no dad no money, didn't know how I was going to eat. Uh, I had no car, so no transportation. So in desperation, um, I literally couldn't pray. And so I just went to the word and just decided, okay, God, this is true and this better be true or else I literally have nothing. So God, you be my mom, you be my dad, you be my money, my food, be my transportation and provide all of that. And um, even though it didn't seem like he was at the time because I was just so frantic and so not in a good place, he was. Um, People were showing up at my house and my parents' house with groceries and meals. People were dropping money off at my doorstep, mm. uh, calling Ubers from out of state to pick me up from APU, to drive me to Torrance Hospital. Um, there was a group chat without me knowing of some friends that would say, okay, who's picking up the Mir family today? Who's gonna pick up Wisdom? She has to get back to work tomorrow morning. Can you pick her up at two in the morning in Torrance? And so I didn't know any of that until after the fact. And so God never left me hanging. I never went hungry. My parents never went hungry. Um, and he also worked a miracle with my mom too. Yeah. She's actually doing so much better. Um, wow. She's dancing again. She loves to dance, so. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, uh, when uh, you and I talked by phone uh, again, uh, w when I hear a fellow Christ follower talk about how Jesus is everything to them, uh, it changes how you live. Uh, how do you see the then? How do you live now? What's different because Christ has been so faithful to you? Um, because Christ has been so faithful and so ever-present, I think the way that God has reflected his personality and his character yeah. in my life and in uh, my friends and families and the way that they have really been there for me and my family, it honestly motivates me to want to be more like Christ because I don't know how some of my friends did the things they did and how Christ came for me and was just so merciful to me at that time and my family. Um, honestly, it just motivates me to be more like him each and every day and just try to reflect um, his personality, even shown in the word yeah. too, as best yeah. as I can. 
Thank you. It's interesting, we're just looking at Philippians uh, chapter 1, verse uh, 1, uh, chapter 2, verse 1, but later we're going to find out that wisdom is actually a perfect illustration of what happens in the rest of Philippians, because really when Christ is at work in people, Christ works through one another to actually watch out for one another, and that's a lot of what you hinted. Thank you, wisdom. It's really encouraging. I want you to look at the Philippians passage one more time. Since there is encouragement in relationship with Christ, since there is comfort from His love, since you have shared in the Spirit, since you have received tenderness and compassion, then, then, live differently. You'll be motivated in a way that doesn't make sense to people. I loved when Marcel said, people think I'm crazy, but I'm just so joyful and thankful. I can't help but to live then. And really what we're going to find in the next couple of months when we talk about Philippians a little bit more, we're going to find out about the characteristics of Christ, humility, sacrifice, ready to give everything for the salvation of you, me, and the entire world. And so this passage is so, uh, it spurs me on, it propels me. It's not a, a consumeristic, well, if Jesus did that one little hookup thing that I need him to do so my life would be easier, if he could solve that problem, or it'd be great if he could pay off that bill, it is the one who has died to forgive me of my sins, the one who has died to love me with everything, the one who's created the body of Christ to watch out for me and care for me, changes everything. I got one more story for you because I felt like today Jesus needed to be highlighted in the real lives of people. And so, Everett, get up here. We got one more. Come on. <laughs> so, uh, pretty much no one is going to ever come uh, hang out, talk to me, or set an appointment again because they're going to be nervous that if they talk with me, I'm going to stick them up in front of chapel. Uh, not always true. But uh, Everett, a lot like Marcel, uh, you came and uh, told me a little bit about your story, and there was something really unique that you did, is you didn't tell me all the details of the challenges and the problems of your life. You just sat there really compelled to highlight how much Jesus means to you. Uh, like the other two, you mind just talking broadly about who Jesus is for you? Yeah, sure. Um, it's definitely been a really busy year. Um, come back to Christ and study abroad in South Africa last semester and had some... Um, not so good things happen in November, but I've really seen like God's really redeemed me and mm. forgiven me of the sins I've committed when I went my own way yeah. and went astray. And also in times of hardship and trouble, he's really been there for me and just brought this comfort and peace over me. Yeah. When we hung out, you started to then unfold kind of uh, some more of the specifics. You might you kind of shared what Christ is to you. Mind sharing in what situations Christ has done that? Yeah, um, so I became a Christian uh, sophomore year of high school, and before that, I, I had this hatred for my dad, and I was able to have that hatred turned into love and forgiveness in Christ mm-hmm. and from him, and also pride in my reputation was everything in my identity, and then coming to Christ, he just showed me, he's like, no, it's about me, yeah. and it's not about you, and that I am your identity, yeah. and so in high school, I started really being poured into by like, my high school youth pastor and some other mentors and uh, through that all those months and years of that like started really feeling this like call to service and ministry Um, but at the same time I in my heart I was struggling with wanting to go my own way and to do my own thing and unfortunately that side won Um, so for high school and even coming to APU um, I had a lot of uh, problems with flings and girls in high school and lustful desires in my heart and just searching for um, comfort and feeling and you know the physical desire mm-hmm. and also um, an addiction to pornography too um, and so um, with an unhealthy relationship and really ungodly one too uh, my first semester of APU I was just struggling with all these things and uh, we broke up in November and that really brought me to like my knees yeah. realizing like I'm not happy, I'm not satisfied, and I really never have been. Um, And so that really started like a process of me coming back to Christ. And in March um, of freshman year, I gave myself back to Christ, and he forgave me and redeemed me and um, said, this is the path I want you to take. And um, he also um, was able to get my addiction up to him and uh, just a lot of restoration in him. Um, Yeah, 
and this past um, semester in South Africa, he really showed me like that he is my redeemer and that um, the path that he was showing me before I went my own way is still the path he wants me to continue on now. Yeah. And that that's still the person that he wants me to be and yeah. um, that I can only be hit that person through him and in him. Um, and in November, um, I'm from Paradise, California, um, small town, um, most recently known for um, burning to the ground. And so while I was studying away, um, I learned that like I lost my house and like 90% of my town was burned down. Yeah. And during that time, like as terrible as it is, like it's just like I had this comfort and peace that I just didn't understand. Um, and I found it in Philippians when it talks about a peace that transcends all understanding, and that's only from the Lord. Yeah. yeah. So, wow. Please, I, uh, um, what is so powerful about uh, not Everett's story, I'm going to call it God's story, is uh, uh, the reason we actually uh, got connected was because of the fire and yet whenever it comes uh to my office and we're hanging out and talking he's bragging about how christ has saved him and what christ has done in his life and the most life-changing thing that i would think would be all he would want to talk about is the fire is he talked about being a different person because Christ had changed him and the fire was next. Uh, in the sense that God has worked in my life and God can work through this fire tragedy as well. And so I just want to thank you for being really vulnerable because there aren't many people who are going to get up and talk about what God saved them from. And I got mad respect for you. Thank you for doing that. Yeah. Um, give me a hand. Thank you. So, so hopefully you, you see why... And a passage that says if, that really is since, and then, how now are we going to live? Why I brought students up here. Uh, part of me hopes that there might be some students in here today who go, I've been hearing a lot of this God talk, and I need this. Because like Everett, Everett didn't really buy into God till late in high school, and then didn't really fully buy in until college. That if you are somebody that's like, I want to start this kind of relationship, it's really cool. I'm going to hang out here, Pastor Leah, Pastor Janet are here on West Campus, a Pastor uh, uh, Kelly is over there. We love to be open that if you or somebody are like, you know what, I'm tired of doing it on my own, I'm ready for Jesus, I want to start this, or maybe some of you are like, like Everett, need to get back to what it means to find life and hope and the only one that can change your life. And then for all of us that have been living in Christ, my question is, have we forgotten and do we need to remember all that God has done for us? Since Christ has done everything, then how now shall we live? That's the question. Uh, I got East Campus and West Campus bands coming up because I thought the best way we could really end today would be in worship and as in song and to remember what Christ has done for us. Uh, but as they're coming up, uh, sometimes as a campus pastor, I get to do uh, brief announcements to make sure everybody knows everything, and I promise it will help you, even if some of you are like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Do you remember at the very beginning, I talked about grace and peace? I need you to give me a little grace and peace here real quick for a basic little time slot switch here. It's kind of interesting. Some of you read your emails. Some of you look at videos. You were supposed to get a chapel survey this week, but it's not coming until March 4th. And so do me a favor. If you read about getting a chapel credit, if you read about taking a survey, go, well, that was really cool that they let us know about it so early. That's really coming on March 4th. And then we will receive your grace and peace because we make mistakes as well. Thank you very much. So now back to Jesus because Jesus is the hero, right? If at the end of this chapel, they're going to sing on east and west. If at the end of this chapel, you're like, I want to talk to one of these three, or I want to talk to a pastor, or I, for the first time, want to say, Jesus, I'm tired of doing it on my own. I've never accepted you. I've never received you. I need you. Oh, that's the best part of what APU is all about, is serving up Jesus. And if you're someone that's wandered, if you're someone who's forgotten, let us know. East Campus and West Campus, we all stand for me. I know the West Campus band's up there. If you'll stand with me, I'm going to pray, and then they're going to sing a portion of a song for the next three or four minutes, and then the bands will let you go. But I wanted us to worship through music at the end here. Lord Jesus, 
since you have done everything, may we not forget, may we live different, may we really be ready for what you have done in us. God, I pray for West Campus as they worship together. I pray for East Campus as they worship together. And thank you for the testimonies we heard today. In Jesus' name, amen.